Man, well, it's so good to be back here. My wife and I just returned from a terrible location, uh, Hawaii, and uh, we were gone for a week. The first time we'd been a week since we started having children, it's the first time that we were away for an entire week. We were in Hawaii. We got to celebrate our 20th anniversary, and it was amazing. So I... Um, I flew in, we landed, I got in my bed about four o'clock this morning. And uh, so I might look like this on the outside, but on the inside, I feel like this. So bear with me. I try not to preach like that. Uh, we're going to continue in our sermon series called The Moral of the Story. And today we'll be looking at the story Jesus shared in Matthew chapter 13 or page 974. If you don't have a Bible, I want to encourage you to take one of the Bibles home with you that's located underneath the seats in front of you. Use it, read it, apply it to your life. Uh, we believe that God's Word will change you. So if you don't have one, we want you to have one. We really believe that uh, it's important. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, uh, again, take that one in front of you. If somebody tries to stop you, you can hit them in the head with that Bible on your way out. Now, I, I love a great story. I, I love movies. I love books. If they tell a great story. So I can watch a romant, romantic movie if it tells a good story, right? Uh, it, I can watch a great adventure movie if it tells a great story. Great stories inspire us. Great stories can change us. Great stories have a way of sticking with us. And one of the main methods that Jesus used as he taught people was stories. He loved to teach people using stories. And that's why we've been looking at these stories called parables that, uh, in the Bible. Because Jesus wanted his followers to change. He wanted them to live differently. He wanted their relationship with him to make a difference in the way they live their lives. Jesus not only taught life change through his actions and through spending time with the people, with the outcasts of society, but he also taught life change through stories that had a heavenly meaning. I was an English lit major when I was in college and I loved the stories that we would read. But even more so, since I became a follower of Christ, when, we, when I take a look at some of the parables that Jesus taught his disciples, I get to dive in to see what is he trying to teach us? What does he want to teach us through these stories? This weekend, we have an opportunity to allow this short, simple story found in Matthew 13 that he told 2,000 years ago to absolutely change our lives today if we're open to that. So let's read in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 through 46. Jesus said these words as he, he painted this picture for them. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, first, I want us to understand this, this passage of scripture in context. First, let's talk about our context. Raise your hand if you ever went treasure hunting as a kid. Right? Raise your hand if you ever drew a treasure map as a kid. And there's nothing buried there, but you put an X on the ground, right? You went out and you navigated around. You did this little map. You went out and found. Well, one of the things that we did as children was my dad would take us out to the local dump on the weekends. And we would treasure hunt. We, we would literally find old furniture, old toys, old clothes. Sometimes we would find TVs, radios. One time we even went out and we found this um, amazing metal swing set that my dad brought home. We would go to a place where other people said, I don't want this anymore and throw it away. So it was free to take. Now we knew where we could have gone to have gotten a nice swing set. We could go into our neighbor's backyard in the middle of the night and take that swing set, but they still wanted it. Or if we wanted a TV or a radio, uh, we could have, I'm gonna move this because 
Just got to back that up just a little bit. Uh, if we wanted a TV or a radio, we know that our neighbors had those in their, uh, their living room. So uh, we didn't break into their house and steal it, but we went to a place where all these stuff was discarded. In fact, there's an entire community online. Uh, if you ever search dumpster diving, uh, there's an entire community online. It's like a subculture that's dedicated to going where everybody throws stuff out and finding it and using it for themselves. Uh, so we were very intentional about where we searched. We intentionally searched among the trash. We intentionally searched among discarded possessions. Now, I know that this might surprise you, right? And you might even gasp in shock when I tell you this. But in Jesus' day, 2,000 years ago, there was no Wells Fargo Bank. There was no Chase. There was no city cards. There was no place anybody could take their valuable treasure and go and say, would you lock this up for me? Every individual accepted the responsibility that for their, valuable, uh, for their valuables, for their possessions, they alone were responsible to keep and guard and protect their possessions. It never crossed their mind that they would go to somebody and say, hey, I want to give you all of my gold and silver and jewels. And by the way, I'm going to pay you a monthly fee to handle my stuff for me. It never crossed their minds. But what did they do? What did they do with those valuables? What did they do with those possessions? Uh, the things that they really loved? You know what they did? Either they would build a safe room on their house or they would dig this floor, dig their dirt floor out and bury it in their dirt floor. But that wasn't any good because the thieves and robbers would say, oh, they just built a safe room so they have something good. So they would take their treasure and they would bury it in a field in the middle of nowhere. That's how they would, that was their bank. That was their vault. The problem is sometimes they would forget where they would bury it. Raise your hand if you ever forgot something important, <laughs> right? We, we do that all the time. We forget things. And so people would forget where they buried their treasure or they would die before they were able to communicate to a loved one. Hey, by the way, uh, your inheritance is underneath the rock and, you know, Mr. Smith's field. You know, they, they didn't communicate that. So what would happen is... Eventually in time, that field would begin to get uh, being worked uh, so they could sow crops into it. And these laborers would come in and they would work for the landowner. The laborers would come in and they're digging the dirt and they're tilling the dirt, using whatever tools that they had at the time to do that. And when they would stumble upon a treasure that somebody had buried in the field, right? Finders keepers did not apply. When these laborers discovered the treasures that would be out there in the fields, if they removed it from the ground, they had to give it to the landowner. It wasn't theirs. That was the law of the land. But there was always a way around the law, right? Any good law has a way around it. So here's, here was the acceptable saying. If they found treasure while they were in the field in a land that did not belong to them, if they found it and did not remove it from the ground, but covered it up, then they could go back later on in the darkness of night when they're not being paid by this landowner and get the treasure and keep it for themselves. Okay, kind of funny, kind of interesting way around it, but that's not what the man in this story did. See, the man in this story went out working for his owner, working for the landowner, found this treasure, he covered it back up. But because the treasure was so great, so valuable, worth so much, the man went, sold all of his property, all of his goods, bought the field so that he could, be, uh, so that he could become officially the owner of the land and thereby owning the treasure in the land. Jesus told that story to illustrate to us 2,000 years later that whether I am seeking or whether I am stumbling, the greatest treasure can be mine. Think about this story. This man was not intentionally seeking treasure. 
He was a laborer. He was working in the field. He was just doing his job when he discovered that treasure. Some of you are in this room this morning and you're intentionally seeking the treasure of forgiveness. You're intentionally seeking Jesus this morning. You've never given your life to Jesus, but you've understood that there's hope found in this place. And so you came seeking that treasure of forgiveness that Jesus is speaking about. You came intentionally seeking, but that was not my story. I was not seeking after God when I discovered this treasure laying out in a field. I was not seeking after him. I understood what Jesus had done for me. I understood that Jesus gave his life for me. I understood that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. But that truth didn't change me one bit until 1991 when the youth pastor said, do you want to accept Jesus as your savior? Do you want to commit your life to him? And boom, I said, yes, I experienced that treasure and my life was changed forever. It, it, the youth pastor explained that sin separated me from that personal relationship with God, that, that my lying, my stealing, my cheating, my swearing, my evil thoughts, my meanness could not merge with God. A few weeks ago in our marriage series, we talked about the oneness. We talked about that oneness of, uh, uh, between a husband and wife, that we are, are pointing to oneness, that that's a goal of marriage is oneness. Also, the goal of, 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 of becoming a follower of Christ is oneness. We get to be known by our creator, God. And he knows us. We get to know him. We become one with him as Jesus prayed in the gospels, that we become one with him. Well, oil and, vent, uh, oil and water do not mix, do they? You ever tried to take oil and water and mix them together? You can put them together and you can shake it up. Oil and water simply do not mix because their substances are so different. It's the same way between me and God. My substance is cheating, lying, stealing. I'm a sinner to the core of my, my heart. I am a sinner. And God is holy. God is righteous. God is pure. God is just. And our two, uh, our two uh, uh, substances can't mix together. It's impossible. So either God is going to have to become sin. If God really does love me, he's going to have to become sin in order for me to experience him. Or I was going to have to become righteous and holy to experience God. And God chose both. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sakes... He made him to be sin. Speaking about Jesus, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Did you see that? You hear what I'm saying? In order for us to have that treasure in the field moment where we discover salvation, where we discover forgiveness, we have to understand that on the cross, God made Jesus into sin and God took his righteousness of Christ and gave it to all those who are going to believe. Why? Because God knew our two substances, natures, did not mix. So he solved the problem. Jesus became sin for you and for I so that we could experience the righteousness of of Christ. That is the treasure that is in the field. That is the treasure that Jesus is speaking about when he said, the kingdom of heaven is like this. It is a treasure, not a burden to be a follower of Christ. It is a treasure of great value to be a follower of Christ. It's not an obligation to attend church. It's not an obligation to change our lives. It is an invaluable treasure that we could never possibly uh, 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 value enough. 
It's the greatest gift any person has ever been given is the gift of forgiveness, that your sins are no longer held against you, that you don't have to pay the penalty for your sin anymore, that Jesus paid the penalty for your sin. There's nothing greater. There's no greater treasure in all the world. It's the greatest gift any person has ever been given. And as a result of forgiveness, we have been given a right relationship with our creator God who loves us. I can speak to him. He hears me. He loves me. I get to open up the Bible and read his word and experience that treasure. He rescued me from sin. He brought peace to me. When I gave my life to Jesus in 1991, I experienced for the first time the life changing power of the gospel. I was made new. I didn't make myself new. The grace of Jesus changed me and I became new. The old life was gone. The new life came. The Holy Spirit of God came into my heart and I was forever changed and transformed. Now experiencing the righteousness of Christ in my life for the first time. There is no greater treasure than that. So the moral of the story is no price is too steep to pay. I I can honestly tell you it has cost me nothing to be a follower of Jesus. Yes, there were some old ways of life that I abandoned. Yes, there were some old things that I, I stopped doing. But following Jesus has literally cost me nothing. Whatever you have given up in your life to become a follower of Jesus was worth it. The man sold everything he had to buy the treasure or to buy the field that held the treasure because the treasure was worth more than everything he had. And I know that we often hear this this message that following Jesus costs. It costs us something. But the reality is what we give up in order to obtain this treasure is, is far less than the value of being forgiven by our creator, God. It's so beautiful. It's so amazing. It's like trading a $5 bill for a $100 bill. If somebody had $100 bill and someone else had a $5 bill, or let's say I had the $100 bill and you had a $5 bill, and I said, look, no strings attached. Will you accept this $100 bill for your five? Would you take it? Why? Because the value of the $100 bill is so much more than the value of the $5 bill. But we live in a world where everybody wants to hang on to their crumpled quarters instead of taking that $100 bill from God. Because we say, this is my life and I don't want to give this up. This is the most important thing. And the reality is what we receive in reward for becoming a follower of Jesus, the blessing, the peace, the hope, the grace, the forgiveness, the kindness, the restoration, reconciliation with friends and family is so much greater than what we give in return. It's so much greater When it comes to receiving forgiveness, we cash in our sinful, no good, rotten to the core lives and we are made brand new, holy, and we have a right relationship with God. When I became a follower of Jesus in 1991, I told everybody because I was so excited. I mean, I was 18 years old. I'd already lived through my high school years of being a, a jerk to people and, and, and running from the people that were bigger than me. I, I, I told my brother, I told my Nana, I told my family, I told my dad. I went back to my old high school and I found those kids that I had picked on, that I had laughed at, that I had made the butt of jokes for four years of their lives or three years or two years, however long it was, every day I went to them. And I said, would you please forgive me? This summer, I gave my life to Jesus and I am not the same kid that I was walking up and down these halls. Jesus changed me. Will you forgive me for the way I treated you? Then I went to the mall. And I told people about Jesus. I walked into the stores of the mall and I'm talking to the customer sales people and I'm telling them, man, my life has been changed. I gave my life to Jesus and you can too. Everywhere I went, I was telling people about Jesus to the guys that worked on the construction site with me, to the people that I would stop and talk to. Why? Because I understood 
the value of the treasure. It was life-changing. Trusting in Christ to save me changed my life and I wanted everybody that I knew and strangers that I didn't know to experience that. And maybe you were like me. Raise your hand if when you became a follower of Jesus, you almost immediately began telling everybody that you knew that you gave your life to Jesus. Yeah, and it's, that's the way it is for many people is when you experience that life-changing transformation, you tell others because it's amazing. I'll never forget, I had a, a young man, his name was Raul. It was on a Wednesday night at First Redeemer Church where I was serving as a youth pastor and I shared the gospel and, and I gave them an opportunity to respond and Raul gave his life to Jesus. He came up and he talked to me and he said, I just surrendered my life to Jesus. I just asked him to forgive me for my sins and, and, uh, and, and what do I do now? And his eyes were filled with tears. And I said, well, what do you want to do? And he said, I'm going to go back and I'm going to tell all my friends about the truth of Jesus. See, it's a hope. It's contagious because you understand the value of the treasure. As I reflect on this passage of scripture, I must ask myself the question, am I still that excited about forgiveness? Am I still that excited about the treasure that I found in 1991? As a follower of Jesus, I began my journey with great excitement. Then I progressed from, uh, from participating in Bible studies to leading Bible studies and to teaching Bible studies because of excitement and because of joy. I surrendered to God to a lifetime of ministry and pastoring because I was excited and felt burdened and compelled to tell everybody else about this great treasure. But after I became a pastor, after I became a pastor, there was this gray area that I wrestled with because now I was telling people about Jesus and every two weeks I was getting paid to do it. Now I was teaching students about Jesus and not as a volunteer, but then I was getting paid to do it. And I began to wrestle with this and I began to walk in this dark gray area and say, God, am I having my quiet times now because I'm getting paid to have my quiet times because I'm expected to be a follower of Jesus? Or am I, am I still a follower of Jesus and just hungry for Jesus? You know, period. Is that, what's going on? And I had to wrestle with that. And during that season of wrestling, God reminded me of something amazing that just because I lost my excitement and just because I lose my excitement at times, the value of the treasure of what I found in 1991 never changes. And there's still a world that needs to hear and understand and comprehend and experience that treasure found in the field in my life in 1991. Did you see the video this past week? It went viral uh, about the police officer, uh, female police officer mistakenly entered the wrong apartment thinking it was hers. And she shot and she killed a man that was in there. She thought she walked into her own apartment. And she saw this figure walking around. She pulls out her gun thinking that somebody had invaded her house and she shot and killed the man. And after she was sentenced to 10 years, the brother of the man that was murdered asked to address the officer. And from the stand, the victim's brother said to her, I know that the world wants me to hate you. I do not hate you. God does not hate you. In fact, God loves you and God forgives you. And as the officer began to cry, the man asked the judge if he could get up and go hug the woman that killed her brother. And the judge said, okay, that's fine. So he gets up, he walks over, and he embraces this woman as she begins to shake with tears because she's experiencing forgiveness maybe for the first time in her life. And the judge, who was so emotionally and spiritually moved, gets up, gets her own personal Bible, walks over to the female officer, lays it down, shows her John 3, 16, and says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And you can find that everlasting life in Jesus. And you can be forgiven for your sins. I want you to take this Bible. I want you to have my Bible. And I want you to read it every day. 
when we remember the value, the life-changing value of the treasure, we can't keep it to ourselves. When we accept that treasure of forgiveness and Jesus is still changing lives today, we get to be a part of something bigger and we get to tell that story. 2,000 years after the resurrection of Jesus, the treasure of grace still changes and transforms lives. So I read this passage of scripture and I have to ask myself this question, who will I joyfully tell about the treasure I found? Telling people in the mall 30 years ago, 1991, there's still people today that need to hear about Jesus. Sharing about the treasure is not a burden to me. It's not an obligation. There's an old evangelism quote that says, uh, telling others about Jesus is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. You know, it's just such a fantastic, fantastic way to express our faith. It's not about judging other people. It's not about coming down hard on how they live. It's just saying, man, I got the bread of life. I've been forgiven for my sins and you can be forgiven too. It's one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. If you discovered a cure for cancer, would you keep it to yourself? My daughter has type 1 diabetes. If I discovered a cure for type 1 diabetes, the very first person I would tell would be my daughter. Why on earth would I try to keep that to myself? If you discovered a cure for Alzheimer's or dementia, if you discovered a cure for AIDS, if you discovered a cure for one of those terrible diseases that we sit and we watch people rot away from and they, they lose their minds and they lose control of themselves, what kind of person would we be if we did not tell people about that cure? And yet oftentimes I look at myself in the mirror and I look and I say, I've got the cure for hopelessness. I've got the cure to help people have a right relationship with God through Jesus. Why am I keeping it to myself? Pastor Chad shared last week about a vision that he has for our church where we all band together and in the next eight years, we want to be reaching 10% of Lake Havasu and 10% of Parker with the life-changing power of the gospel. That means there shouldn't be any services that we have in the future that we're not baptizing somebody that gave their life to Jesus. See, and it's definitely possible for us to reach 10%. And I think God wants us to reach 100%, but let's, you know, we're going to start small, right? 10% of the population in the next eight years of Lake Havasu to share the life-changing power of the gospel with. So let me ask you a question. Is there somebody you know in your world that needs to hear about the treasure of forgiveness? Write their name down in your notes and start praying for them every day that they would indeed experience Jesus and forgiveness and hope. It was 1991, I gave my life to Jesus, I knelt down, and I became a follower of Christ instantaneously like that. And I said, Jesus, would you forgive me for my sins? I surrender my life to you. I acknowledge that you are Lord and you are creator, and one day you're going to return. And in that moment, my life changed. If you would like to experience that life-changing power, of forgiveness. Our prayer team is going to be down at the front at the close of our service. They would love to help you know this Jesus and place your faith in him. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the incredible treasure of Christ. Thank you for the splendor. Thank you for his glory. Thank you for his love. Thank you for his patience with us. God, is our prayer that you would be calling people to you now, that pe maybe people have been running, people have rejected the truth. Uh, they've been holding you at a distance, God, that you would draw them to you to surrender their life to Christ today. God, I pray that you would bless our prayer ministry team as they stand here at the front. In just a moment, give them the right words to say, help them to communicate grace, help them to communicate truth, and help them to give counsel to those 
who come forward to seek to begin a relationship with Jesus. Lord, thank you. And Lord, now place on our hearts those individuals that we need to go about telling about Jesus, not in a way that judges them, not in a way that's ridiculing to them, but in a way that shows them, hey, God loves you and I love you and let me tell you what Christ has done. Lord, thank you for our time. And now, Lord, may we worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name.